Wow, what a build-up. Good morning, everyone. It's around about this time of the year that our thoughts gravitate to the actions of the Australians and New Zealand soldiers uh, at Anzac in April 1915. But one of the other, I should say, lesser known actions took place in early May 1915, the Second Battle of Krithia. And it also involved Australian and New Zealand soldiers. Uh, and it was um, part of the campaign uh, on the Helles Peninsula. So it didn't take place in the Anzac sector and the soldiers were moved down there. So it's not as well known as some of the, the actions like Lone Pine and uh, John Bear and, and those actions, but nonetheless, uh, it cost a thousand Australian casualties in uh, less than an hour to gain a thousand yards. So one man for every for every yard. <coughs> and whilst I knew about the action, uh, I didn't really know a lot about it until I did a uh, battlefield tour in 2019 with a British group from the Gallipoli Association. And that's when the reality of what happened uh, became uh, apparent to me. Where we walked on various sectors of the battlefield uh, and uh, discussed what had happened there. So, in the words of the Australian military historian, Les Carline, the Second Battle of Krithia was battle done badly. And I should say at this point that the modern day name for Krithia, in, in the Turkish name, is Elçi Tepe. So I will continue to refer to it by its name at the time of the battle, but if you see that name mentioned, that's its modern name today. And Krithia, of course, doesn't sound very much like a Turkish name or phrase, and that's because it was originally settled by Greeks. And the Turks pushed them out during the uh, Balkan Wars of 1912-1913. However, there were still quite a few people of Greek origin living in the area, but it was mainly uh, an agricultural area. So let's just look at the overview of where we are in 1915. Well, the war wasn't over by Christmas 1914, and it dragged on into 1915 to a stalemate. On the Western Front, the race to the sea had created a 780 kilometre trench line from Switzerland right up into Belgium. So, think Sydney to Brisbane or Sydney to Melbourne. Continuous line of trenches which nobody could break through at that point in time. On the Eastern Front, the Russians were having a very hard time at the hands of the Germans and the Austro-Hungarians and suffering large amounts of casualties and expending large amounts of ammunition. So, Everyone looked around for where can we try and break the stalemate. And Winston Churchill, who was never short of ideas, uh, who was the first Lord of the Admiralty, or in other words, the Minister for the Navy in the British government, had previously put up schemes to invade Germany through Holland, to invade Germany through Denmark, uh, but none of that was considered to be uh, feasible. So he set upon going to Constantinople and so forcing a passage of the Dardanelles through to Constantinople or now today called Istanbul and going through the Bosphorus into the Black Sea. Now, at the same time, the British government re received a request from the Russians saying, 
we need you to get more ammunition through to us and we also need you to launch some kind of uh, diversionary assault to take the Turks away from the pressure in the Caucasus because in the Caucasus the Russians were fighting another Turkish army. So they were pretty hard pressed on a number of fronts and wanted some relief. By the same token, Britain and the Allies also wanted wheat to come out of Russia uh, so that they could, uh, they could use it. So the Black Sea became uh, a very important area. And this was the prize, the Bosphorus, straight up through the middle there and into the, into the Black Sea. So the plan, the British plan becomes for a naval force to take the Dardanelles, sail on to Istanbul, fire three rounds and the, tank, and the Turks will quail and give up immediately and then we can then casually sail on uh, into the Black Sea. So it didn't quite work like that. A naval for the British naval force, British and French naval force, that tried to force the Straits of the Dardanelles was defeated by the Turks on March the 18th, 1915. And so now it turns into the fact that it has to be a land battle for the army to grab land, to secure the Straits, spike the Turkish guns so that the fleet can sail through to Constantinople. So in this, this presentation, I'm going to look at the reason for the Second Battle of Prithia. We'll look at the ground. We'll talk about the commanders and the influence they had. We'll look at the, who the soldiers were. We'll look at who their, or what their fire support was that they had to carry out the attack. We'll then look at the plan, the reality, the results, and why it went wrong. And in doing so, I'll be talking about a number of different types of units. So I thought that we should quickly have a, a recap on unit sizes. So from a section of 10 to 14 people in a battalion, right up to an army or a force of two corps plus. Now, most of what I'll be talking about will be company, battalion, brigade, and division. And I should say that those, are based, those numbers are based on establishment figures. By the time these guys got to the battlefield, they were probably at about 60% of the figures I'm talking about there now, and, and, maybe, and maybe less. So, the landing plan on the 25th of April, 1915, was that Hamilton's plan was that his main thing was to land on the Helles Peninsula, which he wanted to land at five different beaches, which you can see there as Y, X, W, V and S, around the end of the Helles Peninsula. And in doing so, to seize two important points on the peninsula. One was the village of Krithia, and just up behind it was the high ground called Archibaba. From Archibaba, you could see down towards the Straits, and if you landed and you controlled that area, then you could work your way down behind the gun positions and neutralise those so that the fleet could go through. At the same time, the Anzacs would land at Anzac Cove, with the aim of drawing Turkish forces away from the Helles Peninsula. At the same time, right up in the top, in the top uh, right hand side of the, the slide of the map, the Royal Naval Division would make a feint as though they were going to land up in the Gulf of Saros. Down at the other end of the map, in the opposite corner, 
the French would land a division on the Asiatic side of the, of the Straits at Kumkawa and there neutralise the guns and the fortifications, allowing the fleet to then go through again and clear the minefields and sail on to Constantinople. So these are the types of fortifications they were trying to neutralise and these are the types of guns that were in those fortifications. So you can see that A, they're heavy and B, they're mobile. So the Turks could move them around uh, at will. Now, it would have taken quite a few horses to, uh, to move some of those, but they still could do it if they needed to. So they had mobile batteries all along the coast, the, 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 uh, coast of the Straits. So if we look at why did they then launch an attack at Krithia? So by the 28th of April, Hamilton had tried to, to land the force on the Helios Peninsula. They'd taken extensive casualties at places like V Beach, where the River Clyde ran ashore and soldiers raced out of there, um, and also at Lancashire Landing. And by the 1st of May, two more attacks were taking place and two Turkish counter-attacks had failed with heavy casualties. On the 3rd of May, the French troops, French native troops, the Senegalese, had broken in the face of a Turkish counter-attack and fled all the way back to the beach and had to be rounded up and brought back into the line by a battalion of the Foreign Legion. But the fundamental thing is that by 3 May they'd had 8,400 casualties and the two first day objectives, Krithia and Archie Baba, had not even been taken. So the Anzacs were stalled at the Anzac sector. In the words of one of the soldiers, we were hanging on like a cat on a curtain. And back at Helles, the Turks closed up to the British lines in the hope that the British, they'd be protected because the British wouldn't shell their own positions. However, the British didn't know where the Turkish positions were. So the sum total of the reason for the next phase of the Battle of Krithia is that the landing plan for the 25th of April had failed. However, General Hamilton, the commander, was still telling his boss, Lord Kitchener, the Secretary for War in London, that everything was really going quite well. Now, we're not quite sure which part of the uh, peninsula he was on. What was he smoking? Okay. If we look at the ground, now, you'll see that in the area that we're talking about, you've got base. it looks like a hand. There's basically four spur lines coming down like fingers from the main part of the hand, which is on the high ground. And you can see the village of Krithia, and up behind it, the high ground of Archibaba. And so if we go from the wide beach side up in the top left of the diagram. You can see that a spur line comes down there called Gully Spur between the ocean and the ravine. Alongside it is Fir Tree Spur, which again comes down towards Pink Farm. And then in the centre, coming from Krithia, right down towards the beach is Krithia Spur. And over on the right hand side, is a spur line running up again towards Archie Barber called Caribou Spur. So these were the key pieces of ground. The dominating piece of high ground, piece of high ground over all of this 
was the feature called Archie Barber. And that's a Turk's eye view from up on Archie Barber. And you can see everything laid out in front of you like it's on a sand table. And so they could see everything, anything that moved in daylight, they could see and they had fields of fire. When I was there with the British group up on the, up on the uh, observation platform there where the photo was taken at Archie Barber, they said to me, well, what do you think? And my answer was, machine gun is paradise. Because that, that is what it was. They could see everything. Now down at the other end, if I just go back to my last slide, right down at the other end, uh, near, the, near the letter 13 that you can see on the map, you'll see a feature called Hill 138. And Hill 138 was where the British Commanding General Hunter Weston had his headquarters and it was called Hunter Weston Hill. So here he is looking out over the area that he's got to attack. So here's Hunter Weston's view. Straight up along the spur line, along the road towards Krithia. So again, you can sense the open spaces and the lack of cover. So now let's look at the Allied commanders. First of all, there's General Serene Hamilton the Commander-in-Chief of the MEF, Mediterranean Expeditionary Force, in charge of the whole show. He was a blend of intellectual, poet, free thinker and soldier. He was, at that time, one of the most competent officers in the British Army. Competent senior officer in the British Army. He'd written the Field Service Regulations in 1908 that governed how you conducted operations. And one of those things about the field, one of those tenets in the field service regulations was that you always gave a chap a task and let him get on with it. You didn't interfere. And so, as you can see from the quote by the historian Sir Basil Littlehart, his reluctance to interfere may be explained by his natural kindness. Intervention demanded a ruthlessness which, despite his high personal courage, he instinctively shrank. But he had the experience, more so than any of the other commanders of modern warfare. He was an observer in the Russo-Japanese War of 1905. And it wasn't just standing back in the mess uh, talking about the battle. He had been up front in those actions and saw the effects of shell fire, of shrapnel, of barbed wire, and, and the effects that machine guns could have. But he would always not interfere, and that was one of the critical things about the campaign. If we look at the Allied commanders, and we go over to the left-hand side of the slide, this is Major General Hunter Weston. He was the commander of 29th Division, which was the last regular division left in the British Army after most of the regular British Army disappeared in the late months of 1914 on the Western Front. And he was also put in charge by Hamilton of the Helles sector. Now, he was known as Hunter Bunter or more tragically, the butcher of Helles, because his oft-quoted statement was, casualties? What do I care for casualties? And he had no hesitation about ordering assaults without any pretense at tactical manoeuvring. Uh, and this is how we have achieved the 8,400 casualties to this point, before this battle even ever started. In the middle is General Damar, who was the 
GOC of the Corps Expeditionnaire de Lorient. So, the French. Now, the French were not going to take any soldiers away from the Western Front. They'd suffered immense casualties in the battles, places like the Battles of the Marne and the Race to the Sea in uh, 1914. And so, what they were doing, but they wanted, they had to make a contribution here. So, and increase their influence uh, in the whole process. So, what they were doing was they were using their colonial troops uh, and uh, instead of having their main army soldiers be involved in this. So they were very cunningly using their uh, colonial soldiers. Damard had been sacked on the Western Front as being too pessimistic. And last, over on the right-hand side, is Lieutenant General Birdwood, who was the GOC of the Anzac Corps, which comprised the 1st Australian Division and the New Zealand and Australian Division. And they were on Anzac. So, he was an Indian Army officer um, and of... I would have to say middling tactical ability, but he had the ability to, at times, to spot the right uh, nub of a tactical problem. He was helped very much by his uh, chiefs of staff. If we go on and now look at the front line commanders, these are the people who were right up there at the start of the battle. And first of all, there's Major General Harris, who was commanding the Royal Navy Composite Division. Now, the Royal Naval Division was basically Churchill's private army. He had formed this out of Royal Marines and surplus reserve sailors who didn't have ships to go to. So, the sailors were formed up into battalions, um, named after admirals, like the Hood, Admiral, the Hood Battalion, the Nelson Battalion, etc. And the Royal Marines were formed up into battalions named after British naval depots, like the Plymouth Battalion. He also had under his command, and that's why it was called the Composite Division, he would eventually have the Australians and New Zealanders, but at this point in time he also had uh, couple of brigades of the Lancashire Fusiliers. He had in his Royal Naval Division, because some of his Royal Naval Force was around at Anzac, he had at that stage uh, a couple of composite battalions, one of which was called the Dubsters, and they were what was left of the Royal Munster Fusiliers and the Royal Dublin Fusiliers who had been decimated in the landing. So they had to combine them. If we go down to the left hand side of the slide, Brigadier General Johnson who's commanding the New Zealand Brigade, he commanded the Auckland, Wellington, Otago and Canterbury Battalions and he was a person who was pro probably promoted beyond his cap capability. He had difficulty handling the stress of a brigade command in battle. And later in the campaign, uh, he was uh, removed after the uh, August offensive at Anzac. And then down in the uh, other side of the slide, we have Colonel McKay, who commanded the 2nd Australian Brigade. And that consisted of the 5th, 6th, 7th and 8th battalions, all Victorian battalions. Mackay was um, a Melbourne lawyer uh, and politician. He had been uh, the defence minister in uh, the Reed Commonwealth Government of 1905-1906. Uh, and he was in command of the 2nd Australian Brigade. At Anzac, he had uh, 
followed the orders of the covering force and gone in the opposite direction of um, where he had uh, was supposed to go. But he was a man of great personal courage, but one for following orders to the letter and not absolutely standing back and saying, is this realistic? What are we really doing here? So then if we look at the the Ottoman commanders. In charge of the whole Gallipoli Peninsula was a German general, Lyman von Sanders, who commanded the 5th Army and was the head of the German mission to Turkey. Now, since the 1890s, 1880s, 1890s, Germany had had an influence in the Ottoman army and had sent several training missions there. So he commanded the 19th Division, which was up around Anzac, and the 9th at Helles, and now that the threat was realised, he was starting to move divisions across from the Asiatic side, across onto the Peninsula. Uh, if we go down to the bottom left slide, the next uh, the slide, the next commander was General Esad Pasha, who was commanding the Third Corps, which was the southern sector of the peninsula, 19th Division facing Anzac under Kamal Ataturk, and 9th Division at Helles. He was an experienced commander. He'd been trained at the Staff College in Germany, and he commanded a Turkish division during the Balkan Wars of 1912-1913. The other gentleman on the other side of the slide, Colonel Halil Sami Bey, commanded the 9th Division at Helles. Like Assad, he had again been trained and got experience in the German army and had commanded regiments and brigades during the Balkan Wars. He was again a very capable commander and later on, after this battle, uh, he was replaced after an argument about the defensive layout with the, uh, uh, with the German command. So if we now look at the soldiers, first of all, on the left hand side of the slide is the Turkish Asker, a very underrated soldier. The British thought that they only had to fire a shot and these guys would run. They thought that because the Turks had lost in the Balkan Wars, that that meant they weren't worthwhile as soldiers. But in fact, the Turkish soldier was a very hardy soul. He was well trained in rifle and bayonet work and also camouflage. He could move quickly across country and a lot of the men in these units on the Gallipoli Peninsula had families and lived there, so they were defending their home ground. So they were uh, not, about to, uh, not about to move. In the middle, We've got the Australian soldier, who's now landed at Anzac, and this guy is probably by now uh, in the photo, very overdressed for uh, uh, what they were down to at this point in time, and you'll see that a bit later on. And then the Kiwi soldier from the Otago and Canterbury and Auckland battalions. Now these soldiers had been at Anzac since the landing. If we look at the next lot of soldiers, and you look across to the left-hand side, and I apologise that the photo there is a little bit blurred, but that exotic-looking uh, soldier is a soldier from the Royal Navy Division. And he's kitted out uh, in a khaki version of a sailor's cap with a shade cloth hanging down the back uh, and uh, regulation webbing. And as I said, the Royal Naval Division was basically Churchill's private army. Later on in the war, it became absorbed into the army proper and was renamed the 63rd Division. The man in the middle is a British Tommy. Now he, he was, and you can tell that by the headwear, he was a combination of a regular 
there were regular soldiers there, but in the forces that were now landing to reinforce the 29th Division were Fusilier Brigades, and these were Territorials. These were what they called Saturday Night Soldiers, the equivalent of today's reservists. And Kitchener and the senior commanders absolutely hated these guys. They reckoned that they were not competent. They, they needed to be supervised very closely at all times, uh, and they really weren't uh, properly trained soldiers. And Kitchener set about, as we know, then raising the new armies from the population from scratch, which meant he had a huge training task to turn these people into trained soldiers. These guys at least had some experience. Mightn't have been combat experience, but they had military training. And that prejudice against the territorials manifested itself again the next year in 1916, when they sent the territorial divisions on the 1st of July on the Somme and said that you can't rely on them, they've got to be, you know, you can't let them go on their own. They've got to be, they've got to advance in straight lines. And this was exactly the same kind of mentality that took place in the Battle of Crithia. And of course that set, that set them up as targets. The last man is a Tourieur Senegalais from the French divisions. Now, the Senegalese rifle re riflemen from one of the French West African uh, colonies or possessions. And the French divisions here were a combination of what they call colonial divisions, i.e. these guys, and metropolitan uh, metropolitan regiments. Now, when the French referred to metropolitan France, that included their possessions in Tunisia and Algeria. So in other words, the French divisions were a combination of these guys and the Foreign Legion and uh, uh, other people from uh, outside the mainland part of France. However, like any soldier like that, these guys were well used to bush warfare in the West African countryside, but like everyone else, had no concept of, of being fired at by artillery or machine guns. So you can understand why on the 3rd of May they virtually broke in the middle of the attack and fled back to the beach. If we look at British fire support, the British had only two lots of fire support. One, as you can see, was the battleships and destroyers with naval gunfire. The problem there was that the elevation of the naval guns was only between 13 and a half and 18 degrees, which meant they couldn't hit anything that was behind a hill. They had to get it either face on or if it was a lucky shot up on, up on top of the hill. And the whole thing about it was that they, that they placed such reliance on the naval gunfire. In fact, it was basically, unless you got some really lucky target, it was basically useless um, because it had such a low trajectory and they couldn't hit trenches. They had no high explosive, they had shrapnel rounds and the Navy was hoarding its gun ammunition because they were going to need it when they sailed into Constantinople, weren't they? So the naval gunfire um, wasn't really that effective. The other fire that we had was from the 18 pounder field gun, which you can see on the right of the slide. And the Australians sent five, Australians and New Zealanders sent five batteries of guns around with the soldiers to Krithia, but there were already guns there in action. Now you might think, well, that's, that's pretty good. But again, 
at about 1,800 to 2,000 yards, the 18-pounder had a low trajectory because it was a horse-drawn gun. Um, it was part of the British fascination or they weren't prepared in the artillery sense for the start of the First World War. And they thought that, like they'd always done, they were going to wheel, gallop across the landscape, wheel the guns into position in the open and fire. They didn't bank on there being trenches or hills or anything like that uh, that they were going to face. And so the other problem with the 18-pounder field gun was if you can see behind the man at the gun, there's a, um, a sort of a semicircular little handle coming out from the end of the trail. But that was another fault in the gun because that was the only way you could traverse the gun. The gunners had to pick it, pick it up, pick the trail up, and get around till it was on the bearing. Uh, and so, because of the length of the trail, because it was a horse-drawn gun, and because of that, they were very flat trajectory weapons again. When what was needed was something that could lob a shell up in the air, down, and get somebody in a trench line or behind a, a hill feature. And they just uh, didn't have it, and the only rounds that they had for the, the majority of the rounds they had for the 18 pounders was shrapnel. They had no high explosive for blowing in Turkish trenches, if they could, if they could find them. They also had aviation for their fire support, and they had the th three squadron Royal Naval Air, Air Service, led by the gentleman uh, standing in front of his aircraft up there. But they had a combination of different types. There was normal plane, which is up there with Commander Sampson standing in front of it. Directly alongside that, on the right, was a seaplane which they would lower down off the ship uh, so it could take off. And right below it was the third thing, which was an observation balloon, which two guys in a basket were reeled up from a ship so that they could observe and look for targets. And one of the problems there was that um, the aircraft uh, could signal artillery uh, corrections via a Morse key in the aircraft and it had a trailing wire down underneath it. But they could only signal to the ships because the army wasn't on their bandwidth of, of, of electronically. So what used to happen was, and you remember I showed you Hunter Weston's Hill, the plane used to come in, come straight in, dodging Turkish fire, land, three guys would race out and hold the wings, and the pilot or the observer would get out, race into the command post, and put his finger on the map for the gunners. <laughs> so, that did improve, but, but not, by, not by much. And under the picture on the bottom left, you can see a giant homemade bomb that they made to go and bomb the Turkish positions. And I always look at that and wonder if the plane ever got off the ground. <laughs> it's, so, it's so big. But what they did do was they observed the positions. They took aerial photographs, which was in its infancy, but they were experienced at it. And one of the problems there was that the people they were giving it to weren't experienced in reading aerial photographs. This was all very new. And the army people on the ground didn't trust these sort of mechanics that flew these uh, planes around. And unfortunately for the Second Battle of Krithia, the, uh, they put together a composite 
map from air photographs showing where all the Turkish trenches were. But they couldn't land the plane, and so they had to send it across from the island they were on with a guy in a boat. And the map didn't arrive until after the battle had started. However, they, threw, they flew 2,000 sorties during the whole campaign, including bombing, strafing, uh, and artillery spotting. So let's look at Ottoman fire support. As you can see, the Turks had a 77mm German mountain howitzer. It was a gun that broke down into four loads and could be manoeuvred around the place on donkeys. But it was, the important thing about it was it was a howitzer. It could lob a shell up in the air and down. And they had shrapnel and high explosive for it. The other thing on the other side is that the Turks had the German MG08 machine gun, which they used to great effect. It could provide interlocking fire out to 2,000 to 3,000 metres uh, and was quite, uh, quite deadly. But the important thing that you can see, particularly in the artillery, was down in the, in the corner of the photo is the guy relaying information from the observers. And so this wasn't an example of the ragtag army that was painted, that was going to take off at the first rifle shot. It was a highly organised and uh, uh, competent force. And so if you look at the effect of shrapnel, when it's fired, it has about 370 steel balls inside it. But when it's fired, it's fired so that it detonates, the fuse is set so that it detonates about four metres above the ground. And I've seen it fired, fortunately I wasn't anywhere near it, but I've seen it fired, and the effect is, uh, is something else when uh, those rounds hit the thing. I've seen um, plywood figure 11 targets reduced to the size of toothpicks um, under that. So it was very, very destructive. So on the 3rd of May, Hamilton decides he will now make his main effort down on Helles to capture Krithia and Archie Barber. So he asked Birdwood, send as many people as you can. And so Birdwood sends the five batteries of artillery, which is 20 guns, and he sends his two spare, spare in brackets, brigade, in, in inverted commas, brigades. The second Australian brigade, which was his most intact brigade. And the reason I say that is because from the landing onwards, the other two brigades, battalions and companies and platoons were all mixed up. Second Australian Brigade was his most compact together unit. So he sent that and he sent the New, the New Zealand Brigade. And the, uh, um, one of the Kiwi battalions was actually pulled directly out of the battle for Baby 700 feature up on Anzac to go down to the beach and get into the rowboats to go round to uh, Helles. And so the, the soldiers were tired and exhausted and worn out from being in battle since the 25th. They were supposed to start at midnight from Anzac and be towed around in rowboats to Helles. However, the sea came up and they weren't able, they were delayed for several hours. They didn't get round to Helles until 5 a.m. the next morning. So, so much for getting there under the cover of night. So now if we look at, Hamilton now said, I'm going to concentrate, leave Anzac where it is, I'm going to concentrate only on helis uh, and launching the assault to take Krithia and Archimara. So this was his plan. And it was basically to come round the right flank, up along Gully Spur and up Fir Tree Spur in phase one, with the French moving across from Caribou's Spur, you can see down at the bottom, in the bottom uh, 
right hand side and in phase two to move across behind Krithia and then in phase three to move and to take Archibald. And Hamilton wanted to do this at night. And Hunter Weston said, you can't do that because the soldiers, we've had so many officer casualties that it would become so disorganised we wouldn't be able to achieve it. And so his preferred time to start the assault was 10am. <coughs> in broad daylight uh, and straight across up the spurs. But in fact, Hamilton, had he insisted and had he interfered because he was the commander, had the right plan. That was the, I mean, I've walked up Gully Ravine uh, up until we come out uh, near, near the fir tree there, probably up near the, until the phase one line, and you could have got a force up there. Uh, one of the problems was that they had not cleared Gully Spur of a whole lot of Turkish machine guns who'd moved in there and were interfering with the flank of enemy advancing up there. But his overall concept of going that way uh, was, was right. However, he didn't insist and he let Hunter Weston have his way. And so Hunter Weston's plan was to go straight up the, up the middle and I've drawn in those dotted lines there to show uh, nominal arcs of machine gun, Turkish machine gun fire, and that star thing around the French flag is to indicate that by now the French were getting fired upon by, by Turkish artillery from the Asiatic side. So not only where they're facing the Turks in the front, but they're getting shells coming over uh, from behind, basically from behind them. But on the 6th of May at 11 a.m. they attacked and no, gr no ground was gained and they had heavy casualties from machine gun fire from the redoubt on Gully Spur. So about round where that Union, that Union Jack is up on the uh, top left. On the 7th of May, the New Zealanders again attacked on gully and fir tree spurs. So you can see where I've got the British flag and the New Zealand flag there, that they attacked up those two spur lines. Again, nobody had neutralised the machine guns that were sitting up on top of gully spur. And so their attack again ground to a halt. Uh, with severe casualties in New Zealand and the British 87 Brigade. So it was time to pause and think of, well, how can we do this again? So it was a case of, here we go again. Hunter Weston had no better plan than to get up and advance straight up the, up the middle. And as I said in uh, one of the lead-ins to or the flyer, it's very much like the episode of Blackadder Goes Forth, where Blackadder says to General Melcher, but, but sir, we've attacked eight times in the same direction with horrendous casualties. And Stephen Fry in his best General Melcher condescending says, but that's exactly the beauty of my plan, Blackadder. They'll never suspect we'd be so stupid as to do it again. <laughs> so they went over the same ground as the last four attacks. In daylight, because they'd lost too many commanders in previous assaults. Naval gunfire support was useless and the Turkish positions were not exactly known. The Turks had very, were very good at camouflaging their positions and they didn't know exactly where they were. And particularly units who were positioned, like the Australians, right down the back near the water. They didn't have any idea where they were. 
The other problem was that the maps were inaccurate. That units were reporting where, reporting their position when in fact that wasn't really where they were at all. There was also a shortage of gun ammunition. The guns had 5,800 rounds, which is not a lot to expend on an attack where you want to suppress the enemy whilst you advance across the open. And so here we go, from Hunter Western, Hunter Western Hill, right up the spur, right up the middle. And the assault units were, as you can see, on the right or the seaward side, the Royal Naval Division composite, which included 88 Brigade, the New Zealand Brigade, 2nd Australian Brigade, the Lancashire Fusilier Brigade along Gully Spur, and down at the back, 29 Indian Brigade. Now, here's 29 Indian Brigade down the back, and they were reluctant to use the Indian Brigade because they didn't know how they would go fighting fellow Mohammedans. Now, 29 Brigade consisted of the Sikhs, 14 Sikhs, who were, have their own religion, Sikhism, and the 5th, 6th and 10th Gurkha rifles were all Hindus. So, in effect, he kept a very potent combat force out of the battle because of this in, totally incorrect and prejudicial uh, feeling. And over on the right hand side was the uh, French 2nd <coughs> and 1st Divisions and the 2nd Naval Brigade was alongside them and linking with, linking with the flank, supposed to link with the flank of the 2nd Australian Brigade. And the reason that the 2nd Naval Brigade was over there was to bolster up the French and make sure they didn't bolt again back towards the water. Okay, so the reality is that the Australians start to move on the 8th. And what happens is that on the 8th, 10.30am, the New Zealanders attack up Fir, Fir Tree Spur and again come to a halt. The New Zealanders are at, at 3 pm. The New Zealanders are ordered to attack again at 5:30 pm. And Johnston rings up and, and queries the order and says that it can't be done. And he's told that it must be done. And so he acquiesces with that. But the CO of the Wellington Battalion, a Colonel William Malone, who uh, unfortunately was killed later at Chirompere, and a very strong personality, said, no, I'm not going to assault until those machine guns over on Gully Spur are neutralised. And the British Battalion commander alongside him on his flank agreed with him. And so the New Zealanders at that point in time uh, didn't didn't move. So at 4.30 or at 4 o'clock General Hamilton appears on the scene and realises that nothing is going quite tickety boo and finally decides to give an order and says instead of pursuing the Fusilier and New Zealand assault up the right flank, at 5.30, the whole line will get up and move forward and take Krithia and Archibaba with the bayonet. So at 4.30, the Australians are still back down near the water when they get the order uh, to move. And Colonel McKay is off visiting one of the battalions when the signal comes through and they send a runner for him and bring him back and he gets his orders, um, which wouldn't have been too detailed, I wouldn't have thought at this point in time, and he's told 
to fix bayonets and storm Archie Bar. And at five past five, there's a phone call, uh, his brigade signaler, for McKay from General Paris. And General Paris says, and McKay says to him, I don't think we can get to the start line by 5.30. And General Paris says, you must, you must get there by 5.30. And then Paris says to him, do you have any bands? And I think you can imagine even McKay would have held the phone out and gone, what? And he said, no. And Paris says, oh, uh, in that case, do you have your colours with you? <laughs> and McKay says, no. And he said, oh, well, at least you've got your bayonets mm -hmm. because General Hamilton wants us to put on the biggest show possible to G up the French. <laughs> and this is where I go back to saying in my title about 17th century warfare, where you're advancing with bands playing, colours flying, etc., etc. And this is total, this is the total unreality of the whole thing. So the Australian Brigade starts to move off and They go from their camp at Skew Bridge, right down at the bottom here, and they start moving up along the spur with uh, six and seven battalions in front and the fifth and eighth behind them. And they start moving through the reserve trenches and at 5.30, they almost fall into a trench that they didn't know was there, but it's full of English soldiers. And naturally, of course, on the maps, it's called Tommy's Trench. But they then discover that that's the front line. So they start to move off. And of course, as, as soon as they started to move, they started taking shrapnel fire and machine gun fire. And so they moved into, uh, very quickly moved into what's called artillery formation, where uh, they have, uh, they spread out to avoid excessive casualties and start to move forward. But they've got no real idea except to keep going forward till they get to Crithen. And so they start to suffer horrendous casualties as they move up. Mackay gets up with his periscope and says, come on Australians, and that's, you see in that painting there, and starts to lead them forward and starts to hurry them up to get forward because that's what he's been ordered to do. Uh, and He's starting to take casualties. Uh, the CO of the 7th Battalion is killed. Several of the senior battalion officers are killed and the others close up and, uh, and carry on. Charles Bean, the former Sydney Morning Herald journalist who is now the official war correspondent and will later become the official historian, is moving up also right behind the assaulting waves taking notes. And in fact, as the battle progresses, uh, he's involved in uh, trying to uh, give water to casualties and also uh, pull, pull men out of the direct line of fire. And in fact, during that process, uh, he's also wounded, one of the three times he was wounded uh, during the war. But the Australians move up, they keep on moving forward. Some men are seen holding their shovels up in front of them, hoping that it's going to deflect the bullets. Of course it doesn't. Um, and in, to cover a thousand yards and in an hour, we suffer over a thousand casualties. And so by the time of 7.30 p.m., the battle has well and truly run out of steam. They've had to send the 5th Battalion across the other side to prevent them being attacked by the Turks from the Caribbean Spur. And the Canterbury Battalion has moved across onto the other side of the Spur to protect the flank of the Brigade. But the Brigade has virtually disappeared. McKay keeps going until later on he's hit in the leg and uh, severely, severely wounded. 
And so by 7.30, they're still 2,000 yards from Prithi. And the battle then peters out and they're told to dig in and get the best spot you can for the night. But the problem there then is there is no system of casualty evacuation. Most of the wounds have been caused by the machine guns and have been leg or stomach wounds. And so, so many men died out there during the night through want of being, even despite the best efforts of the limited number of stretcher bearers and fit mates who went out to get people, um, a lot of people died who didn't necessarily have to die uh, during, during the night. And so the attack peters out and that's the results. And the New Zealand Brigade lost 800, 2nd Australian Brigade lost 1,056 men in an hour. Overall, including the British and French, 6,000 men had been lost in one night. And so if you look at those guys there, that's D Company of the 7th Battalion, 27 men left out of 225. So why did it go wrong? Well, there are a number of factors, I think. Deference, in other words, defer to people, don't interfere. From, this came from the top down, of course. It was the, you know, don't interfere, don't question anything. Ignorance, that they didn't know, they had not learnt the, the modern methods of warfare and the effects of machine guns. Arrogance, that they thought there was no need to use any methodical approach, just charge. Prejudice, particularly against the Turks, who they thought were going to run at the first shot, at the Gurkhas and Sikhs, who they could have used to great effect and did later. And the Territorials, uh, who they thought were just not first class soldiers. And every, there was no command exercise, there was no battle procedure, there was no time for battle procedure, no time for the, the business of warning orders, reconnaissance, making a plan, issuing orders down three levels and then moving. Not in that time frame. The total indifference to casualties. The casualty, uh, the casualty evacuation system, apart from the brigade bringing its stretcher bearer sections with it from Anzac, was basically non-existent. And that is not just the Australians and New Zealanders, it was basically right across the whole thing. The casualty system in this campaign was appalling. And every principle of war, they break. Right? Selection and maintenance of the aim. I've got a question mark there because, well, they did select an aim and they did maintain it, but it wasn't the, it wasn't the right one. Concentration of force. So they spread everyone out. Instead of concentrating the way Hamilton's original plan was, they just spread everyone out and <coughs> charge. Cooperation. Nobody really knew what was going on, except they just had to head up to the front. Morale. I don't think it, you know, the total lack of planning and everything did much for, for morale. Flexibility. Absolutely none. Offensive action, and I've got two question marks there. Well, yes, there was a lot of that, but it was the wrong stuff. Security, no cover, operating in daylight across open ground. Surprise, absolutely none. And administration, in terms of casualty evacuation systems and that, were just absent. There was no attempt to manoeuvre. There was total ignorance of modern warfare and the effects of weapons, and they were using 18th and 19th century weapon methods. Reliance on the bayonet to carry the day, and in Les Carlin's words, it was battle done badly. 
And I put those two statements up there um, <coughs> so that you can see that General Hamilton was still waxing poetical, uh, but the private from the Lancashire Fusiliers brings it down to uh, the reality. And as a postscript, on May the 11th, the Anzac Brigades returned to the line at Anzac. On May the 12th, six Gurkha rifles took the Ottoman machine gun redoubt on Gully Spur by night. May the 28th, the Manchester Territorials advanced the line 200 metres at night with scarcely a man lost. Also, 29th Division and 42nd Division advanced the line forward at the Daisy Field and Spurwood by night with minimal losses. And in the period 25th of April 1915 to 16th of January 1916, when Helles was about finally evacuated, the day one objectives of Krithia and Archibaba were never captured. Thank you for your attention. I know I've run a bit long, but uh, I'd be happy to attempt any questions. Thanks, Brian. Mm -hmm. uh, we have some time for questions. Yeah, everything I read about the Second World War, especially about the Gallipoli campaign, it's a classic example of a really good idea that was done really badly. And I wonder how much of it comes back to, firstly, the fact that it seems to me nobody had even bothered to look at what had happened in the 19th century, especially in the American Civil War, where yes. every one of those lessons was there to be learned. Yeah. And secondly, it always seems to me there was almost a prejudice against being a staff officer, and you needed good staff. And there just didn't seem to be any to do the planning, to do the logistics, to do the mapping, to do the intelligence. Um, o officers were not encouraged to go to staff college. I know. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, Quite coincidentally, I read, uh, I, I was reading uh, a book that I picked up on um, Major General Neville Howes, who was the uh, Australian uh, Director of Medical Services. Mm. And it goes back to his, he won a VC in the Boer War, but it goes back to that where one of his fellow doctors, uh, a gentleman by the name of a surgeon from Sydney and Sydney University called Scott, his surname was Scott Scurvy, uh, didn't endear himself to the British by saying that um, he thought that the army was the playground uh, of the aristocratic and moneyed classes and that it was a nice way to spend the years of your life between 20 and 40. And I think that sort of encapsulates the whole thing. There was no attempt at uh, professionalism. And there's that oft quoted phrase of an officer saying, I wish to God this war was over so we can get back to some real soldiering. <laughs> right. Is it, was it the case that um, there was intel that was ignored or, or that there was yes. no intel? Yeah. Uh, the, uh, there are two very good books. One is uh, 36 Days and the other is Gallipoli Air War. Uh, written by the same guy, Hugh Dolan. Hugh Dolan. Yeah. Uh, and they are extremely locked, enlightening books about what happened and how they gathered information. There is also, they also had detailed information. There's this thing about they didn't have any detailed information about the peninsula. They also had very detailed information about the peninsula from the British guy who was the vice consul in Chinacle and who used to go over to the peninsula and walk around having a jolly picnic and what have you, but while he was doing it, he was making notes and marking the maps, and he was sending information back. But, you know, that wasn't gentlemanly. You know, to the sort of thing that, that wasn't looked upon as being, uh, as being gentlemanly. Yeah. But yes, they did have a lot of, and they didn't, they didn't trust anything new. You know, it was, all newfangled. As I said, the pilots were regarded as damn mechanics, uh, and their place was taken in another era by the uh, uh, people in the tanks. 
who were also referred to by horse cavalry as men and cats. But that's what they, they did. You know, people like Hunter Weston and those senior commanders, uh, you know, they came from another, another era, mm. uh, unfortunately. And let's ask also, perhaps, um, looking back in hindsight, um, that perhaps the thoughts and the plans of the day were more about uh, not wanting to spend time on the peninsula because they wanted to get across into the mobile guns, and that perhaps the defence of the Turks caught them by surprise, so they were completely out of their depth. They weren't prepared for it because they thought it would be quicker than get across, and perhaps the certain underestimation of the Turks, but not having a plan B, created. Mm -hmm. Into a, into a siege rather yeah. than the initial objective, which was to get across the peninsula and get to their guns. Yeah, yes, I, I agree. Mm -hmm. And I, I also think that at Anzac, you know, the whole objective was to get to the 971 feature, the highest feature on the range. And the more that I've looked at that and the more that I've looked at maps, I've queried why was that so important? If you wanted to get across, and cut the road network that went down to the coastal guns, then why were you fiddling around trying to go up there? The only thing you, that the Turks could do from up there was wave. <laughs> you know, I mean, you, you're quite right. They, they, I idea. think they, they totally, you know, well, you, you can tell from the first day one objective, advance from the beach and catch Prithia and Archibald. There's no way were they going to be able to do that. And also, they were working off, to some extent, they were working off incorrect maps, um, which didn't help, uh, didn't help either. I always wonder, how does the Ottoman, um, how do they view the Second World War created now, considering this is like their military? Um, they, yeah, yes, they do. Um, uh, and, um, uh, but the, the thing that overrides it all and is almost now a Turkish national day is March the 18th, which was the name of that. Uh, and that's what they that pin their thing to. And also, I've seen um, up at Anzac, up on uh, the heights near Chumper and the Neck, uh, Lots of uh, Turkish school groups uh, come up there and they're all told the history and uh, at one stage they were throwing rocks over the precipice from quite short that they thought that was in Australia. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, they, they, uh, it's one of the, the things from the political Questions? All right, well, I'm just on behalf of the group, Ron, just thank you so much for your presentation. Well, I think this is another uh, presentation of how uh, the tragedy of uh, yeah. the early years of World War I. We know that through research that by 19, late 1917, 1918, the British hmm. did start to take some lessons about what had happened early in the war, but I think um, it's a good example of the, the the arrogance, as you said, the, the lack of command structure, that was uh, quite apparent in the early parts of the war. So thank you so much. So let's put out the next one. So while we're here, we'll just uh, do a little raffle. We'll ask Ron to pull out. We've got four books. You get your uh, tickets ready. Um, name to pull down. Numbers. It's a yellow uh, F6. F6, so uh, anyone got F6? Just make your way to the